if you are if you are applying for a job in in industry you would use a resume but then if you are applying for a job in academia if it is academia the health sciences and all that you would normally will use a cv but in ghana we use them interchangeably like i said but technically a cv is longer than a resume Yes, uh, I'm sure maybe right. Rafael may, may want to add up to what I've said. All right, Rafael is joining us again. But so if they ask me, for example, I see it. Okay, so you you talked about the length that TVs are longer than resumes, right? Yes. Is there any other difference? Because I want to know if I see a job application and it says submit your CV when, you know, should I, can I submit a resume or something or I can just go ahead and submit what I have. And even the, I think the question is, what makes a CV longer than a resume? What information is inside a CV that is not inside the resume? For which reason it is longer? Okay, so I think that, yes, like I said, in Ghana, Rafael is on now, okay. Oh, is it better now? Yes, Rafael, fantastic. Yes. Thank you. I can see you, yes. Okay. Okay, so like, like I was saying, the CV is longer because it has uh, more details of um, the candidates. The resume is usually a summarize. Uh, it contains summarized information of the candidates. So what makes the CV longer is that it has more information, more details like the work history of the employee and, and all that, yes. But in Ghana, like I said, we use these terms interchangeably. So you see a job advert that says CV, resume. Um, yes, in Ghana, we, it's, it's one document. We, we know it's CV. But then sometimes you may see resume CV. It's the same thing you can send your CV. All right. Maybe Rafa would like to add up to it. Okay, yes, Rafa. Yes. yes, we're talking about so the difference between CV and resume. All right. So basically, um, the resume is more concise and it's used for corporate purposes. But when it comes to the CV, it's most of the time for academic roles, for roles that are related to academic purposes. But one of the key differences with when it comes to CV and their resume is that in the American setting, you would have them differentiating between the resume and the CV. Basically using the resume for corporate purposes and then the CV for academic purposes. But in other jurisdictions, like in Oxford, it's used interchangeably. So for instance, in the European market and in the African market, what the Americans refer to as the resume. It's, same, it's the same term that we use as CV. So when in Ghana or in UK or in South Africa, somebody, a job says, we're looking for, for you to send your CV, it's the same term that Americans use as resume. So basically, aside the scope or the purpose of the resume being for corporate environment and CV, in American setting, being for academic purposes, in the European and other African settings, when they ask you to send a CV, it's also for a corporate sense. So it differs in purpose and also the region to which all those things are being requested. All right, so Rafael, quick follow-up question. So which one is better? If, for example, I'm in Ghana, I see this job advert, send in your applications, should I send the shorter resume version or the longer CV version? It's always better to send the shorter version. So for instance, as I was saying, if you are in America and you, you get a job role and they ask you to send your resume, it means it's for a corporate role. And in the same sense, if you're in Ghana, they see a job advert and they ask you to send your, um, your CV, you need to send the purpose 
or the, the role that is made for the corporate environment. So you don't need to send like um, a four pages document. Those ones are for academic purposes. You just have to send a concise one showing all areas of your work experiences and your educational background. We only send a detailed CV for academic purposes, like four pages or five pages. But for job roles or for corporate environments, it's always best to send a concise CV, what the Americans would term as a resume. Right, so it's the shorter, the better. So the shorter, the better. It, looks, it sounds like, all right, that's interesting. Yeah, exactly. All right, Enoch, I have a question. I want to ask now, what will be the standard parts of a resume? I would now call it resume so that everybody's clear that is the shorter version that we are looking at. What would be the standard parts for you when you receive resumes, what do you expect to see on them? Okay, so um, I think that for resume or CVs, um, I will look at, first of all, the summary, summary of the candidates. Then it, it also depends. I think there are three formats. Okay, before I, I even go into the details, there are three formats. Okay, so um, we have the chronological format, the functional format, and then the, also the combination format. The first one, chronological format is normally for people who have more experience. So if you have more years of experience, no gaps in your employment history, you would want to go for the chronological format um, where you showcase your work experience, okay? And then your education and qualification, you bring it to the latter part of the document. Then we have the functional format where you would also bring your skills first, your, your skills and your educational qualification. So the functional format is good for first time job applicants, like people who are leaving school, university graduates, uh, you may have very little experience in the job market. So maybe you just had your national, you completed school, you had your national service, you are searching for your first job. So in this case, you, you would have to bring your educational qualification and your skills first, followed by your work experience. Because maybe at that time, the only experience you may have is just your national service and maybe a few internships that you may have taken at a point of schooling. Okay, so it depends on where you are in your career. If you are a first time applicant or you have less experience, then you would have to go for the functional format where your education, your skills come first before you, you bring your work experience. And then you have, if you are a very experienced person, you have a lot of work experience, you go for the chronological format where your work experience shows more than your, um, than your um, education and qualification. So briefly, let me go through um, the formats for the purpose of our participants and um, audience. So basically, I'm looking for the parts. I'm looking at a summary of the candidate. I'm looking at your work history. That is for the chronological format. I'm looking at your skills. I'm looking at your education. And of course, if you have some hobbies too, you can add it. Um, you, then your referees, referees too are required. So that is for the chronological um, format. We also have the, the functional, we can start with your summary, then you have the qualifications, the skills, education, and then work history. So you realize that with the functional, the work history comes last, but with the chronological, the work history is second after your summary. So basically, these are the standard formats that any recruiter or any HR person will cast when um, receiving CVs for any job role. All right, thank you, you know. It may, for me, a summary is put your strong foot first. What you feel is your okay. advantage. Okay. You put yeah, it first. All right, I'm going to just mute Benji. <laughs> he doesn't mute himself. Okay. Right. Okay. So you put your strong foot first. What you have, you put it out there so that 
the recruiters see that one first. Okay. All right, Rafa, I have a question based on what Inoka said. You didn't say it, but I, I want to ask, when you say summary, that part of a CV where you put like the summary of everything, what's the best way to present the information there? Because work history is straightforward, educational, straightforward. You just put dates and stuff. But when it comes to the tricky parts, the summary, the skills, you know, what exactly are you looking for? So maybe, Rafael, you tell me about the summary. I'll come back to Enoch for the skills so that we move on from there. Okay, so basically, when we talk about the summary parts, um, what recruiters look out for is, one, what the candidate is bringing on board and what the key skill of the candidate is. So um, the summary doesn't have to be a very long one, like um, half a page or five sentences or six sentences. The maximum should be about three or two sentences. And every summary for me should differ from role to role. So if you are an applicant and you are applying, let's say for an HR role, at the same time, you being an applicant, you have interest in customer service. The summary that we use to apply for the HRO should be different from the summary that you use for a customer service role. Because for each of the roles, it needs a different skill set. So you have to couch your skill set that you have for a particular role. But whatever way that you couch it, let your key skill that is relevant for the job role come out more. So it indicates your skill set and where your interest lies and how relevant your skill set is for that particular role. All right. Okay. So I focus on my skill and then how it's relevant to what about um, what people call personal statements or something? It's also at the front there. Is that different from the summary? Okay. So you know, it's you basically have people talk about maybe I want to become this in this, you know, usually that's what I see people writing that someone who has a desire to maybe become an HR professional in the long term and to work in an organization where I'll be something, something, that sort of thing. <laughs> I don't know if that's a, okay. a good thing. Yes. Yeah, so basically, um, some people use it interchangeably. The others who say career objective or personal statement. But when it comes to the personal statement, it's most of the time used in the application. So I'm sure we'll come to the application, but that's where the, it's more detailed. The personal statements are usually more detailed. But the career objective is a summarized version that you put at the beginning of your CV. So that is where you summarize your skill set and where your interest lies. Okay, all right, thank you. You know, let me come back to you and ask you about the skills. What should we put there? What, what I'm asking my question because I know an, a number of people who just write, um, like sometimes you can see the same thing on every CV you get. You can see um, team player, good communication skills, um, what else? Someone who is adaptable. You have the same things over and over again. I mean, is that okay? Or there is a need to be more specific when you are mentioning your skills? Okay, Amy So yes, I think that the skills aspect is very important. And um, let me make the point clear that um, you shouldn't use the same skills for every job application. Um, <clears throat> you need to study the job adverts, understand the role. So if you study the job advert very well, you would know what the requirements are in terms of skills. And you need to tailor your CV to meet these skills. So I, I normally will hear people say that, oh, I've been applying for jobs for maybe um, the past one year, two years, and uh, I'm not getting any call for any interview, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes this is your CV. You are using the same CV for every job application, a generic CV. And you may, you, you may never get any, if you are lucky, fine, you may get one or two calls. But 
if you really want to get results, you need to work. Job search is a full-time work. I know it can be very frustrating, but job search is a full-time work. And um, candidates or, or people who are looking for jobs must see it as such. You need to put in the effort. You need to work. You see a job advert, and then you just send your CV. No, you must sit down, go through the job adverts, understand the requirements, the role, what are the skills that will be needed for this job? That is the question you need to ask yourself. And based on that, you pick your CV, you go through your CV. You, you may find some of these skills in a job ad advert. So you check your CV, you have those skills already. If you have it, fine. If you don't have those skills there, uh, then you need to include it in your CV. It is very, very important. And then skills come in two forms. You have the hard skills and then the soft skills. The, the hard skills are normally what we call the technical skills, which is directly related to the job. And the soft skills, we are looking at um, skills like your communication skills. We are looking at leadership skills. We are looking at your attitude, um, your team playing skills and all that. These are skills that are, they are soft skills because they are difficult to learn. They cannot be quantified. And normally when it comes to promotion, employers consider some of this. So they are very, very important. Hard skills can be learned on the job easily, but soft skills are difficult to learn. So employers play um, a lot of premium or importance on these soft skills. So right. basically, yes, don't just put, put any skill on your CV, study the job adverts and know what to include in your CV for each, treat each application a unique one with its own um, qualities. Okay, thank you. All right, so I learned about hard skills and soft skills and the fact that you need to combine the two of them when writing whatever you are, when putting in your application. All right, okay, that's a good one for me. All right, Rafael, I want to talk about personal information. When is personal information too much? What's personal information is not necessary on our CV and um, what is necessary on our CV? What, what, what should we take out that is a bit too personal? Okay, when it comes to the personal information, I mean, there are some rules that may come with specifics. So first of all, you need to know the kind of rule that has been done. But if the rule doesn't indicate a particular information that you require, for it. It's advisable always not to put your date of birth. So you see somebody saying, uh, putting it out there that my date of birth is 1973 or 1990. There are some of these um, detailed personal information. When you put them there, it creates some biases. So if in the minds of the recruiters, they are looking for an older person and you are much younger, they are likely to strike you out, even though you may be qualified for that role. But if you skip it and your CV is very attractive, then they will invite you for the interview. Then you get the opportunity to actually prove yourself. But if you put your date of birth there and their mind they are looking for an older person, you may not even be invited for the interview at all to come and prove yourself. In, in, the, in the same vein, if they are looking for a much younger person, and you are older, and you put your date of birth there, they will not even look at the other information. They will just strike you off. So for date of birth, I, would, I won't advise you to put your date of birth in your CV, unless, of course, the rule demands a date of birth. So recently, I was um, helping someone out to um, draft their resume um, CV for academic purposes. Now, the rule indicated that they are looking for somebody less than a particular age. So in, for that particular rule, you need to put your date of birth. So that's the instance. But if you've not stated the required age, it's always not advisable to state your date of birth there. Mm -hmm. And then also stating your gender. Yes, there are some, I mean, there are Ghanaian settings. Once you look at the person's name, you can always tell that the person is male or female. But it is not good for you to put your gender there because of the biases, because some people can decide to use your gender 
against you, although it is not supposed to be done. And okay. another thing too, yes, were you saying something? No, you go on. Okay, another key area that we people, I find it, people like putting over the their locations. You don't need to put where you stay on your CV. So for instance, for your location, then maybe you go right. Um, Nima, Mamubi, or Latabi, or Koshi, or I mean, all those things, people already have bias in their minds. So once you put your exact location there, it may create some bias against you. It's always better to put your city, let's say Accra, Cape Coast, Kumasi, the key cities, put those on there, but don't put your exact location or your house number. All, all those residential detail. You don't need to put those things out there. Okay. And then I, another thing, yeah, I have so, stopped I have stopped putting even my um city there because there's no postal address, nothing. It's just email and phone number. <laughs> I don't know if and, um, yeah that, that's what I would advise. For personal information, it's always better to put your name, your email address and your contact number, your mobile phone number. That's what is most of the time advised. But other personalized information, your date of birth, your location, your street number, all those things, I mean, they are too detailed. And for international brands, they, they, they take data protection very, very easy. If you put your data out there, it could be used against you. Because it's not every company that are compliant to certain things. A recruiter, or if the company is not really compliant, they can use your personal information against you. So you don't need to put out everything. Yes, you are looking for a job, but you don't need to go very, very, very detailed with your personalized information. All right. Thank you very much, Rafael. You know, I'm going to ask you to um, take us through the current trends in CV writing and just take us through what has changed over the years that we need to know. You are in the HR field. I mean, I'm sure there are certain things that have changed that we may not know of in, when it comes to drafting your CV or, or resume. So, I mean, if you can just take us through a few things or if it hasn't changed too, you can let us know. Okay, MFA, so I think that um... When you talk about a modern CV, um, I would say that um, technology has um, impacted the recruiting field a lot. Because of technology now, um, CVs should be readable by ATS. ATS is applicant tracking system. Most multinationals and big organizations use ATS, the applicant tracking system, for their uh, recruiting processes and all that. Yeah, so if you ask me what a modern CV is like, I would say that a modern CV is, um, is, is one that is readable by an ATS. Okay, so when I say readable by ATS, I mean that your CV should be compliant with the ATS. And ATS, like I said, it's a software. It's a software that the companies use to, um, uh, to do a short listing. Now, recruiters don't have time to sit down and go through thousands of CVs, going through them one after. The, initially, when they start education there and the people apply, you, you can receive thousands, two thousands of CVs. You don't have the time to go through each of them. So these softwares do the work for them. The softwares would separate the good CVs or CVs that meet the requirements from CVs that do not meet the requirements. So that is the work of the ATS. So now our CVs should be such a way that the ATS should be able to read the software should understand. You know, the internet is lagging, please. The internet is lagging. 
the internet is lagging for Enoch. I, I think it's and to that, there are things that you your the way am I am I audible from the video now? Is it okay, Emifa? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Okay. So um, like I was saying, there are things that you, you need to take out of your CV now. So things like if you have um, images, should images shouldn't be part of your CV. Okay. Images um, or necessary border lines shouldn't be a part of a modern CV because these things, the ATS software may not be able to read it. And your CV, no matter how good you are, if you have these things in your CV, your CV may be rejected by the software. So it is very, very important that you don't put images in your CV. You also have to make sure that your spellings are correct. Your grammar is on point, okay? Your grammar is on point. Your spellings are correct. And then you use simple grammar. Don't use jargons that the software cannot understand, okay? Simple grammar, um, summary, work history, skills, educational background, like simple, normal, we can understand and, and pick your CV. Other than that, your CV would be rejected. Yes, so um, not much changes. I would say that technology has brought all these changes. Previously, recruiters would sit down and do this hard work of going through these CVs. But now, because of technology, the software does this work. And if, if you put images and all these things in your CV, you are likely to be rejected. So the software is programmed, okay, to understand certain keywords. When I was explaining the skills aspect, I said that you need to study the job. Study the job advert, go through the job description and pick the skills, pick keywords from the job advert and make sure that you have these keywords in your CV. You have a high chance of being, I mean, um, qualifying to the next stage of the recruiting process. So they, it is programmed to also pick certain former employers that one you have no control over, certain years of experience and certain schools. These are things you have no control over. But then what you need to do is to check your grammar. You need to check your spellings. You need to check your alignment, your font sizes and all that to make sure that everything, I mean, is, is on point. So once you're able to do this, I think you, you, you study the job well, you tailor the CV to suit the role that you're applying for. If you're applying for a marketing role, you don't use an, an HR CV for a marketing role, for example. Uh -huh. And if you're applying for, let's say, an operations job, your CV should depict an operations person. You are applying for a warehouse person, your CV should depict a warehouse person. So it's a lot of work, like I said. Searching for a job is a full-time work. It is not a joke you need to put in the effort if you want to get results you need to put in the effort if if you want to use a generic cv then you would you struggle to get an interview because these days getting an interview is not even easy to get the interview alone you need to put in a lot of work and then when you get the interview you need to also prepare that is another stage of the process where you need to prepare for the interview also so you, you don't want to, I mean, fall into the category of CVs that are rejected by the ATS or the applicant tracking system. So MFA, this is what I can say for a modern CV. Uh, maybe um, Rafael would like to add something to it. Yes, Rafael. Or if you have, if you have follow, follow up questions to Well, I, I do, ask. but I would like to hear Rafael's own. Um, those okay. sending in your comments just relax i'll read all of them when we finish this part and then you can have your questions answered so ralph do you have something to say about the trends in cv writing resumes what has changed okay so just to add um with regards to the formats that are used there's a bit of a change I, I wish I can even share can I share my screen so so recently I don't know those who were on the internet um, Bill Gates 
um, CV went viral. The CV used in 1973. It yes. went viral. Wow, if you can share now, I've made you a call. Let me, let me check if I can so like see how. Okay, so while Raphael is trying to share, um, I've had now like many CVs that are with different colors, blue, orange, you know, different colors now. It's very colorful, the CV. I think someone also sent in a question as to whether he could use a colorful template for the CV. You know, at first we used to think it's just black and white, don't add any colors. But today when you go, online, for example, and you want them to help you. There are many templates that use different colors. Is there, is it acceptable or is something that we should be wary of? I will just ask Enoch so that Raphael can sort out the screen share. Okay, almost sharing the screen. All right. Is it, is it visible now? Yes, let me see. Yes, I can see okay, it. So, so, so clear, but... Okay, so did the CV do get used in 19, <laughs> over 30 years ago? So if you check how the CV looks like, it's very detailed, but at a glance, it will put you off in terms of the font size used, the format, I to look in and all that. Certainly you can take, tell that um, they use a typewriter for this CV. But with regards to the modern trends, we have more applications, more format that are online that you can use. Just as Inok said, it's not advisable to save your CV in an image form because there are some systems that would up upload your CV into their portal. And if your CV is not well formatted, it will not pick up the information embedded in your CV. So now there are two, it has CV applications that have even shifted from going to organization to drop your CV or even sending by email. Most international brands have now moved to their career site whereby you need to upload your CV. So if you have not saved your CV in the, in the right format, the system may not be able to pick up the information embedded in your CV. I can tell you now, as of today, so there was recently, recently we did a job application and we're looking for candidates. There was a candidate who uploaded all the documents. There was assessment that was conducted, the person passed, but the system could not upload the person's CV. So as of now, although the person has passed, there is no contact information, no CV received in the portal. And I'm told by this that the person is praying, but the person needs this opportunity. Wow. So if your CV is not in the right format, the system may not pick up your CV. It's always best to save your CV in PDF, either PDF or Word, but the best one is always in PDF. All right. Okay, thank you. This Gate CV is an interesting one. Did he use, is this just, I mean, is this all the CV or there's some part somewhere? No, this, this is all the CV. This, wow. is, this is the first part, yes. This is the first part. Certainly the content of the CV is there. Like you could tell he's very qualified. He has stated his experience, the rules, where he has worked and all that. Mm. The key areas are still there. He, he highlighted on his objective, the education, the work experience, are there the skills set? Everything has been indicated, but the formatting may not be the right one and the outline. But the modern trend is that save your CV in the right format, use the right spaces, use the right font size. It's always good to let bold in the key areas. So, for instance, if you are sending your CV, don't use the same format for work experience before and then the title use different formatting for so let, let's see if you're using education the title of the education should be different from the education itself. so if you have education let's say you are telling the university of ghana the font size 
that should be different. It should tell the heading or the subheading of a particular area that you are telling the recruiter about. All right. Okay, thank you, Rafa. Do you want to attempt my question on the colorful series? Yes, yes. It, um, sometimes there's, I recently I saw someone's CV, the person has used purple, and I saw another CV that they've used red. When it becomes too loud, it puts recruiters off. Keep it simple. Don't use more than two colors. Yes, there are some that they can use different, different colors, but it, it, the colors should be, it should be very, very light. It shouldn't be so bright, like red, green, purple, all those things. They are very fancy. You are not coming to show us the design of the scene. It's about, it's about what you are putting out there. It should just be catchy. That's all, but they don't be too colorful. Like you, someone will say, I want to use my favorite color on my CV. No, this is not fashion show. Don't use pink on your CV. No, don't do that. Keep it, tone it down. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. I think I will be trying to round up my um, section, but just a few ones. Um, should I put my replays on my CV or leave them out? Is Enoch still on the call? Okay, I think he, we lost him, but he's joining. So, Raphael, that's to you. You know, okay, so with regards to reference, um, it's always better to indicate your reference if the role requires you to indicate a reference. But if they don't request you to state a reference, it's not, I, I, it's not advisable to put your reference there. So, you can always provide that. References shall be provided upon request. Yes. It allows for you to put that you, you provide your references upon request. Mm. All right. But if you are using it for academic purposes, your CV is going to be for academic purposes, then you need to state your reference. And even sometimes it goes to the extent of you stating the names of your supervisors. So for the academic role, it demands you state your publications, the kind of researches you are doing and all that. So for those particular areas, you will need to indicate even your supervisor's name, the one supervising your project with. And that's for the academic, but for the corporate roles, you don't need to state your reference unless the rule demands that you state your reference. I think Enoch, Enoch is back on now. All right, okay, Enoch. You're welcome. All right, I'll take a few questions. Um, someone is asking, Mary wants to know if she can take out her interests and skills when writing a resume. Interests and skills. I think skills, no, but what about interests? Enoch, would you like to attempt that for us? Yes, MFR. <clears throat> yes, MFR, um, yes. I think that like you said, skills, yes, is a must. Interest, I would say that if your interest aligns with the role that you are applying for, then you can, you can have it on the CV. You, you don't want to put uh, anything on your CV that will make a recruiter reject you, okay? So if the interest aligns with the role that you are applying for, then I think it will be a plus for you as a candidate to have it on. Okay. So for, for example, let's say um, you are applying for an HR rule and maybe one of your interests is that you are uh, a fun loving type, like you, you, you like to have fun. You, 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 you are able to get along easily with people. So this is something you should, you should put on your CV. So that is how our, our answer is. It will depend. You have to evaluate each case and then decide. If your interest aligns with the rule, keep it. If it doesn't, then you have to take it off. Yes. So no need saying I have, I like singing, you know, <laughs> when it, I, it has absolutely nothing to do with your, your role or, um, or Russell playing football. Would you put that on your CV? 
Not at all, not at all. There are some, you see, um, the higher you go, the, the more you reduce some areas of your CV. So I think when I started my career at a point, my national service day in my beginning of my career, I used to put even my Virginia high school I went because by then I was school prefect. So my leadership skills, my leadership skills that you see, senior school prefect, this junior high school, it was there on my CV. But at a point, it was not needed because the higher you go, you have to reduce some areas that you cover. Wow. And under a key area that you also need to put out, the kind of school you went to. So if you are rising your career, it will get to a point that you need to even take out your senior high school. You may even need to take out your junior high school. All those ones, you don't need to even state it. When it comes to your interests, don't put it put interests that are even linked to the role you are applying for. So if, let's say I'm recruiting for a social media uh, manager or a social media executive, if you put your role as interest uh, maybe for internet surfing, that's, that's linked to the role. But, or you are applying as a cook, and then you indicate, I love cooking. That's it in line with the role you are applying for. But if you're applying for, let's say, um, HR manager, or you're applying for a CEO of an organization or a marketing executive, then you're going to put something um, playing ampy or do game, all those things are not, I mean, they are not so very relevant to the role you're applying for. To the role, all right, okay, thank you. Delight wants to know if there are some online resources, links, or sites that you can use for CV review. And um, does it mean you send your CV and then they review it for you? I think that's what she wants to know. Do you know of any, Ralph Enoch? Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. So now, now we have we have millions of portals that will just ship in your CV for you. And I think I would advise everybody to rather use those resources than drafting your CV on your own. The, those particular resources, shipping, make them more, um, in terms of the formatting, the outlook, it makes it more sharper. So we have resources, and I think there is one that I used recently for somebody. It's called, it's called Resume Now. So there's one, I'll, I'll try and put some of the, them in the comment section. Right. And then there's also another one called Resume Genius. All those ones, are, they are free. You can just register them. It will just give you a template, a portion for you to put your educational background. When you're done, you go to your working experiences. You're done, you put your skills. You go to your references. By the time you finish, you put it in all this, then it will just bring out a nice CV for you in different formats for you to choose from those ones. So for me, I would advise you to use those CV templates. All right. So delights, that's they are free. Um, I tried one recently. It wasn't free anyway. <laughs> and they didn't say it from the beginning, but I reached the end. But I liked it because I saw what the end product was like. And so I just made the edits on the CV I was working on because I was helping someone with the CV and I wanted to just see what these online ones could give. So I reached the last stage and they wouldn't allow me to download unless I edited, unless I paid. And I said, well, if that's the case, I can see what the final scene is going to look like. So let me just apply the changes to what I'm working on. But Rachel says resume now is free. So delight, you can try that. And then hopefully your CV will be looking better. And you can send it to me to have a look at. I think I'll just give some nice giveaway for people to send their CVs for me to look at, maybe at a discount or for nothing if you attended this event because we do that. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, MFA, is it, um, MFA, just to add, can I just show two pictures of how it looks like? Sure. Recent one that I downloaded sure. online. Sure. There's one. Sure. Let Please me just quickly share my screen so share you can see how. Share your screen. I will. Okay. So this is a recent template. So if you have a CV like this, mm -hmm. the format will just pick up your information and generate the CV for you. So this one, once you put in all your information, your data into the system, 
you can either give you a particular format like this or under format. Let me just share under format with you. or something like this. So same information, but the system will give you different formats. All right, all right, this is great. Yes. This is great, this is, this is great, this is great. For someone like me, I, I just like to see this, and then I can just put in the information with the same format, but this is easy to replicate. So even if you don't even want to go through this or you end up on a site which is not free like mine, at least you see how the, the information is arranged, you know, and how the points are there. You should be able to replicate it. Or just go there like Raphael said. Okay, Raphael, can you just stop sharing your screen so that I can take it? All right. So I think Ebenezer had a comment. He said, um, there are firms that have specific templates for CV. Um, he worked for a German consultancy and they had the DevRx, which required even your passport picture, date of birth, marital status, etc. Any other type of CV is rejected. I think Raphael mentioned that if they require it, it's fine, but if they don't, then you keep it out. Okay, Enoch, can you use abbreviations when writing a CV? No, I think that a CV is a formal document. It's a business document, and therefore it has to be treated very formal. So abbreviations are not encouraged in CVs. Uh, it's not professional. It doesn't send a good signal about you as, as, the, as the candidate. You have to write everything. Whatever you want to write on your CV, you should write it in full and use, I mean, good font size it should be structured. The, the CV, Raphael just, I mean, shared. You could see that it is well structured and the font size are readable and, and all that. So abbreviations, no. I, I want to encourage anybody to use abbreviations. CV is a formal document. It's a business document and has to be treated as such. Right. Thank you. Um, does anyone have a question to ask? You can raise your hand or else I will move to the cover letter session. You can just raise your hand. I will unmute you for, otherwise I will just count down. Okay, Oman Bapa has raised her hand. So please unmute and ask your question. Hello, good evening, everyone. Hi. I'm Oman Bapa Kosa. Thanks to the organizers and uh, the panelists as well. My question has to do with, uh, I think I, I sent it to you before, but I didn't get a response. Do you need to include your current job, even if it doesn't align with the, the job description or the job you're applying for? Is it advisable or it's not? Hello? Okay. Yes, my people, Ralph Enoch, who is going to take a crack at this? Because I, I don't okay. know. Okay, so. I wanted to give a typical example. Yeah, you can go on. Okay. Okay. Currently, I'm teaching. I'm teaching. I'm a agriculture science teacher at a at a high school, and uh, there's a job that was seeking for uh, irrigation assistance, and uh, I have that training already. So I applied and I included my current job in my CV. Which so is I the teaching to... teaching assistant? No, I I actually teach agriculture science at a high school. Okay. And the job that I, also, I applied was irrigation assistance. Okay. That's what they were, they were looking for. So I included my current job required in, in the CV. So I wanted to know if it's advisable. If it's not advisable, the next time I would commit the same mistake. Thanks. I think that, okay, maybe Ralph, let me say something before you come. I think that, so if you, if you don't include your current um, job in the CV, it, it, may, it may lead to a gap in your CV, okay? But the example you are citing now, you, the teaching is in the same field as what you are applying for. 
irrigation assistant is somehow related to um, the subject that you are teaching. So I, I would look at it from a transfer of knowledge perspective and say that, okay, yes, even though I am a teacher now, but then the subject I'm handling, okay, has something to do with the job that I'm applying for. So it depends on how you look at it. And also the way you, 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 present, you present the information because not stating your current job may cause a gap in your CV. And when there is a gap in your CV, you may be questioned, why is there a gap in your CV? That is a question. Does it mean that during that period you were not working, you were not doing anything? That is another issue to also to be discussed. Why were you not working? Uh -huh. So it depends on how you, you present the information. So I would say that look at the situation. And then in this, in this case, you can link. You can link the irrigation assistance to your teaching job. That is what I would say, Ralph. Okay. Okay, so just, just to add um, to this point, it's very, very important not to leave gaps in your CV because it can actually lead to your termination in your employment. I've had cases whereby employees hit some information on their CVs and later when we found out, um, the organization has a right to even take this scenario actions against you. So better state your, the, your current role, but find a way of linking your role to the role you are applying for. So if you are applying for this irrigation project, you've done a study in, it, in that particular area. So that is why you state all those things in your cover letter, which will be going to very soon. So you inch or, or highlight those key elements and, and how they will be to your benefits. So in your cover letter, you indicate that I've, I've, I have this particular training that I've undergone and how those particular ones are going to affect the job role. Um, I would advise you to take off your current role at all. You need to state it. Okay. Because if you don't state it, it will, it will, it will be tantamount to um, you um, omitting a key role on your CV. Okay. And Lastly, my last question, uh, with, with, with respect to my CV, I would, let me, okay, let me bring it down to my scores for the work experience on each uh, for that I worked. I, 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 I mean, I, I build in there, I make it bold, then I bring it down in a blue form to state the activity that I did. Unlike where I have a portion where I've indicated other skills, but for each sector that I worked, I make a platform to list the activity that I did, the things I did. If it's communication, I'll talk about it. If it's research, I talk about it in that order. Is it also the best way to go by? Yes. Okay. So I th yeah, you know, okay, so I think, yes, it's, it's, it's okay. So you need to um, distinguish between, like I mentioned earlier in my presentation, hard skills and soft skills. Hard skills are technical skills related directly to the job that you are doing, okay? So in, in the explanation you are giving, the bullet point will be the hard skills aspect. That is where you, you need to list your, your hard skills. And professionals will tell you that skills are not enough. Skills are not enough. Maybe, I don't know if Rafael has mentioned it already, but your skills are not enough. In your CV, you need to make provision also for your achievements. It is very, very important. Um, you need to make provision for achievement. You need to showcase what you have achieved, okay? In as much as you are telling the recruiter that, okay, so I work at ABCD company. I was marketing manager. These were my duties, ABCD. The question is, what did you achieve in that organization? So you need to also include your achievement it is very very important okay so your your soft skills should be different from the hard skills the hard skills like i said these are technical skills related to the job then your soft skills is also stated differently soft skills you are looking at your communication skills your leadership skills your teamwork skills okay your attitude positive attitude towards work and all that 
So you need to distinguish between these two clearly on your CV. And don't forget, like I said, add some achievements. We want to know as a recruiter, if I see you have achievements on your CV, I mean, quickly, it, it catches my attention. I see you as someone um, who is a go-getter, some, somebody who is serious. So you may want to work on that aspect as well for all the participants who are on the call. Ralph. Okay, so I think Enoch has um, put that point very right. You can state your, the role or the duties that you perform for each role, but what should come out more should be your achievement for that role. And always have in mind to link whatever point you are putting on your CV to the role you are applying for. So just as you said, your current role is um, an agreed teacher. Find ways and means of bringing out areas of the teaching that are linked to the irrigation officer role that we are applying for. So state the roles that you performed and then your achievements that you got from that particular role. So it's okay for you to state your duties and the achievements. All Hello, right. Yeah, Oman, Bapa, are you okay? I'm satisfied. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much for your question. I'm going to just move on straight up to the cover letter bit. And then if you don't mind, if there are more questions, you can put them in the chat and then we will move on. So I am so excited to be discussing cover letters because I have a, um, how will I say it? Okay. Well, <laughs> let me just say, I, okay, I have, I think Kweku Sinti Mensa's hand up. So can I take that question? Okay. If it's on CVs, you can unmute yourself and ask quickly before I switch topics. All right, please unmute yourself. Kweku, hi, we can't hear you. I think you are unmuted, but we can't hear you. Okay, I don't know if the hand is open. Now, my, my challenge is... All right, my... okay, let me just move on. Okay, so let's talk about cover letters and why they are necessary. What is in a cover letter that's not in a CV? For which reason they ask us to write it? I think many of us don't like writing cover letters. I, for one, I will quickly just send you my resume, but when you say I should write a cover letter, then I start shaking. Okay, well, shaking, not literally shaking, but take us through cover letters, Raphael and Enoch, why it's important, what is different, what is in it that's not on the CV, and what will make it stand out for you as HR people. So I think anybody can okay, start. Ebe, just ebe fa, okay, thank you. Fa. I think that um, a CV it's not enough to sell you as a candidate. That is where I want to start from. As a candidate who is looking for a job, yes, I know some, some jobs will say that um, send your CV, okay? Some will say just send your CV and that is all. <laughs> the hiring manager or the recruiters will use your CV to do the assessment, do the short listing and, and then go through the hiring process which is fine, which is okay. But you, you get some organizations too that will say, send your CV and your cover letter. And I think the reason is, is because a CV is not enough to sell you as a candidate. Therefore, in, in, in a cover letter, you have the opportunity, okay, to sell yourself more. Uh, apart from what you have stated in the CV, in your cover letter, you are able to tell the recruiter why you are the best candidate for the job. You are able to express your knowledge about the industry in which you are applying to work in. You are able to express your enthusiasm about the, about the role that you, you want to apply for. Okay, so in, in general, that is the rationale behind having a cover letter in addition to a CV. The CV is not enough. You need a cover letter in some cases to sell yourself better
to the recruiter or the hiring manager. Um, we will go into the details of um, the parts and all that. Rafael, uh, you may add up. Okay, so um, thank you, Enoch. Um, just to add, I've seen a lot of applications before that you could tell that this cover letter has been used by the applicant at different, different places. So the person is applying to a particular company, uses one cover letter, goes to another company, uses the same cover letter. The cover letters are supposed to reflect the key skills of the candidate, the achievements of the candidate, the working experiences of the candidate as well. So you are supposed to, it's, it's just like you have your CV, but putting your CV in the summarized form. So on your CV, you could see at the top, we have the career objective. Now, when you come to the cover letter, expand that career objective more. Sell yourself. It's just like you being in an interview and you have been asked the question, why you have applied for the job? What skills do you have? So have a summarized point of what you are going to see into the cover letter. So you can see most investors, outside investors, when you're applying for, for the even Ghanaian one, they would ask you to write the personal statement. It's the same thing that you have to use for your cover letters. So just indicate your work experience and how your skills are applicable to the role you are applying for. That is why you don't need to have a generic cover letter. You use one cover letter for different different companies. It's not advisable. It's always good to have specific cover letters for specific roles. So just to cite the example of the gentleman who said he is currently an administrator and is applying for um, an irrigation officer role. So it's a cover letter that you pinpoint to them that you've taken these particular courses, which are going to inure to their benefit. So it's just for you to sell yourself in your cover letter. It shouldn't be very long, but let your skills come out. Let your working experiences come out. Let your achievements also come out. All right, thank you. So I think what I picked was, you know, every job application and its cover letter. It can't be the same thing for the same. And we see this all the time. <laughs> all the time it's as if people don't know you see this all the time you have people even we send the, sending an application and then they go like i would like to apply for a job in your company you know and the whole thing is about a role in it like in a di different industry you know the person has forwarded the cv for a certain role and added that cover letter without even changing anything on it i think that we have to watch that so those of us who like blast CVs and blast cover letters, like maybe you're applying to five companies, so you just send everybody the same thing in the cover letter. I think that, I mean, this is a warning to us that we don't do that. You know, like Enoch said, you may be looking for a job desperate, but it doesn't give you the right to just send off everything that you have to a thousand companies every day and expect magic to happen. You take your time. We change it for each rule so that it works for you. All right. So Enoch, I think you were very eager to take us through like briefly the parts of a cover letter and what would make it stand out if we, we wanted to we wanted to catch your eye, for instance, you Enoch, what would you see in a cover letter that would make you say this is a good candidate? Okay, so MFA, yes, um. I think that for a good cover letter, it should be well structured. And usually you have to start with the contact of the contact of the candidates. Okay, so you would have the email at the top at the header section. You have the email, you have your mobile number, you have the poster address, okay, at the top. Then below that, you would have the date, okay? You should have a date. Then you have the contact of the employer. Yes, contact of the employer. I'm sure that um, somebody may be thinking, how do I get a contact of the employer? Yes, you need to, like I said, I said job search is a hard work. You, you need to put in the effort. You need to work. So you need to search, you need to use the social media and platforms. LinkedIn, if you are not on LinkedIn, 
in these times we find ourselves, then I don't think you really are a serious professional. You must, it's a must. You have to be on LinkedIn. For any serious professional, you should be on LinkedIn. Okay. So you can search on LinkedIn, the company website, and then look for the name, especially the name of the hiring manager. You should use the name of the hiring manager. If you, find, if you don't find the name of the hiring manager, there are options or alternatives that you can explore. You can address the department. Let's say if it is a creative um, department, you can say, dear creative department. Okay, and then the address follows. And then you come to the opening paragraph. With the opening paragraph, you have to be enthusiastic. Okay, you have to express your enthusiasm about a role and you present a specific example of your skill to grab the attention of the employer. This is where you need to actually catch the eye of, of the recruiter. Okay, your, your par opening paragraph should be strong. It should be strong enough to catch the eye of the employer. So your skill should show forth at the opening paragraph. You should, you should let the recruiter know who you are by your skill in your opening paragraph. Then you come to, when you come to the body, you can talk about your professional qualifications, which you may have already um, stated in your CV. Like uh, Ralph said, it's, it's, a, it's a summary because you already have it in your CV. So your professional qualifications, your unique skills, okay? Don't forget that you are competing against numerous candidates. You are not the only person applying for the role. So what unique skills do you have that will make you stand out as, as a candidate? So you need to also show your unique skills and then also your contribution to the company. What are you bringing on board? What do you bring on board? If, if the organization should give you the nod, what are you going to bring on board? What are you going to add to the organization? So your value, the value that you're going to add to make the company successful should be also in your body paragraph. Then in your closing salutation, you can round up your strength and reiterate your interest in the job, okay? You round up your strength and reiterate your interest in the job. You, you provide a call to action. Give the employer the incentive to get in touch with you. The closing salutation, um, uh, that is flexible. You can, you can choose sincerely yours, warm regards, best regards, however you want to put it. But it should be formal. It, it should be formal. It should be formal. So basically, I think this should be the structure of a, a, um, a cover letter. This will be the so your contact, the date, the contact of the employer, the salutation, opening paragraph, your body paragraph, your closing salutation, and then finally, yes, your, your closing salutation, and then finally, your. I not. Okay, I somebody's on mute. And finally, you okay, so maybe Rafa this point. Rafa. That's very detailed. Thank you. Wow, if you want to add to it. Okay, yes, let me just add some few things. So I mean Pinoc has already given a very detailed descriptive um, areas for the cover letter. Just to put some few highlights. So from the top, when you are giving the address of the company, most of the time you, you, you get, you receive an application in the office and then you open the document, then you see the, the interim, the director, various titles. You need to be sure about the company you are applying to. Who is the one recruiting? Who is the hiring manager? So don't address it to the CEO if you've got the CEO doing that, the hiring. 
don't address it to HR admin if the leader of the department is not um, HR admin manager. So you need to be sure of who the hiring manager is and address that person in that capacity. If you are not sure, that is when you have a generalized one to the hiring manager or to the director. And also the address of the company. You can't indicate, um, let's say, the hiring manager or the director and this and this company, then you write Accra, Ghana, if the location of the company is in Kwasi. So you need to be sure of where the company is located. Because if you get our company address wrong, then it means you have not done your research very well. So all those little, little things tell who that candidate is or how qualified you are. So you need to be very, very specific when it comes to certain things. And then you also have to check your data at the top. So if you are applying for a role and then the date at the top is showing last year's date, then it means that you've been sharing that same application for different roles. So your date has to be very, very current. Now we are also fond of using BSA, madam. It is fine if you are not sure that is the best way out. But you can go a step further to know who the hiring manager is. Is the person a male or female? Then you can address the person. But if you are not sure, you can go ahead and then use the DSA, madam. It's more appropriate. Now, when we come to the subject. You see a lot of people putting application for employment, application for employment. That is so wrong. That is a more generalized application. What role are you applying for? So you need to be very specific. Don't send your application to a company, application for employment. I've seen a lot, a couple of them. Those ones, once you see them, you don't even want to read them because it tells you that the person doesn't know the kind of role he or she is interested in. So be specific, application for employment as a customer service executive, application for employment as a security officer as this. Be very specific about that particular job you are interested in, and then you apply it as such. I think the content, I won't go there, you know, because I already give the detailed areas of the content. Now, when you come to the end, put your name, yours faithfully, your name comes followed by your email and your contact number. It's fair for you to put your email and then your contact number at the signatory part. And make sure that you, you, you sign your document. If you are submitting hard copy, don't, don't leave it unsigned. Make sure you sign it. That is why it's there. If it's a soft copy, now we have electronic signatures. You can still sign your document and save it in a PDF format. That shows you are very serious, but don't leave it blank there like that. It's supposed to be signed. Even if the, the, the company is uploading it, there's a career site. Get your document signed. Once they request for a cover letter, it means they are serious about it. So you also need to be very serious with your cover letter. I think these are some of the highlights. And then before I forget, you see, once you are done with your cover letter, too, if you are going to submit your cover letter by email, the same thing, your email application should also follow key. So the subject of the, of the email should reflect the subject of your letter. So application for employment at that particular role. There are some rules that will give job codes. They will give job codes. If they provide job codes, make sure you put that job code in the subject of the email. So if application for employment as customer service executive, then you see into bracket, then you can put the job code. And most of the time, this um, US embassy, most of these international companies, it comes up with a job code. So you need to add the job code to the email because the recruiter is going to receive thousands of emails. Most of the time, they will just be clicking the subject because they are going to sift their email by the job role. Every, every job role has a timeline for the interview process. So if they've advertised five roles and you just write application for employment, the recruiter behind the machine, what we usually do is that you just go to the subject, your search engine, and then type the subject or a keyword of the role you are recruiting for. So if they type customer service executive and you have not put the subject of the role you are applying for, your CV may not come up. 
to make sure that in the, con in the subject of the, of the email, you put the role at that particular column. And I think that's very, very key as well. All I don't right. know if I'm, I'm exhausted. You guys things. have I taught me so much about um, good cover letters. I, I never knew that writing address was such a big deal especially because of the email. I felt that, well, if you're sending it via email, nobody puts address at the top and down, you just send the email and we are done. I mean, but what about, you know, I've, I've been to some application sites where there is a section for the cover letter. You don't have to like attach it as a separate document. There's a space for it. You just type it in and then you click enter. You know, so with that, too, I have to put like my address, student's address, all of that before I type it in. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. Yes, yes, yes. So some recruitment portal, career sites would not give you the option to attach the, the cover letter. Yes, you just the best thing, very good. The best thing to do, don't type straight into the portal. If there's an error with your grammar, it may not correct it. Some of them will not give that auto correct and all that. Type it in a Word document, copy and paste it onto that portal so that if there are any grammatical errors and all that, you can see them. If you type it in the street, you may miss some items for the, um, I mean, in terms of your constructions and all that. So type it in a Word document, copy them, paste them into the portal's platform. And you will still need to put the same format of the cover letter, add the uh, salutations and all that in that space. I see, okay, that's a new one. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I've learned about the different parts, the fact that you need to highlight your strong skills, the fact that it needs to relate back to the job requirements, and the fact that you need to pay attention to the little things, the openings, the salutations, the sign-ups, and how you do all of them. I think this is high time that you went to look for your English notes from JHS and SHS. The one that they teach you how to write letter. They said, dear madam, how to sign yours sincerely and all that. It would really help. All right. So my time is so fast, so gone. Yes, so fast, so gone. So it's gone. And so I would like to just be able to talk about interviews a bit and then i will also go back to look at more questions that i received and so let me just have you give me a summary of your top three tips for example when it comes to acing an interview for you rafael for you you know and um, your experience with what people usually get wrong that they don't know, that you feel that we should know about when we are entering an interview, whether it's virtual or it's physical. Now there's a lot of virtual interviews. I wish I had time to go into all that, but you know, so just maybe top three tips that we need to remember. And then Enoch to you would share your top three tips. And then I think I may be rounding up after that. So if you have a question, this is a good time to put it in the chat because after this question, okay. I may not, I may not ask any further questions so we can close early. Okay, let me let me just speak on some few quick areas and Enoch can also add them. Now you need to check your grooming. That's the first key thing that you should be um, like be mindful of. So if you are whether the interview is going to um, take the shape of on virtual or direct. Your dressing is very, very important. Recently, I conducted an interview and the person was very good, but the dressing of the person, I mean, that was the reason why we didn't select the person, honestly speaking. So how you look for the interview will tell us that you are, how serious you why, are. How was the person dressed? I would like to know, how was the person dressed? The person was wearing the jeans. A nice jeans, it was very nice, but it was, I mean, hospitality, how you look is very, very important. And if, if you are applying for a top role, make sure you put a put on a jacket. Don't wear short sleeves. Put on a jacket. If you are a lady, you can also get a jacket get or a dress. But make sure they are corporate dresses. Make sure you are looking 
very solid for the role. Don't take any underestimate any role. Recruiters have various areas that they are looking at. They are looking at your aside your work experiences and your skills. The way you talk, how you look is also very important because you are coming to lead a team. The way and manner you are even walking in from the security entrance, how you walk to the interview room, how you even sit when you get to the, 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 the conference room, all those things have been looked at. So your grooming is very, very important. If you are going for an interview, the kind of hairstyle you have on can also put the recruiters off because every organization has certain rules and policies. So if you are coming to work, I am in an hospitality environment. So as a lady, you can't be having multicolored hairstyle in an interview. You can't be having, um, you can't pierce triple or whatever. If you are coming for an interview, if you have triple hair rings, leave one on. If you have pierced, leave all those things out. If you don't take it, those things may not in themselves be bad, but they are you create room for biases to be held against you. And then another key thing which I want to state is interviews look at, interviewers look at where you are coming from. Are you coming to speak bad about your previous employers? There are some people who currently start complaining. I left my job because my, my boss is a very bad boss. My previous company, they are very bad. They don't treat us well. Once you start telling us all those things, it tells us that when you come, we are you. You are going to do a, do similar thing against us. So don't bow mouth your previous employers. It's a red flag for us. Last area, make sure that you separate yourself from your previous organization very well because reference checks are now important for all international brands. We will certainly call your previous employers to know how you left them. If you don't leave on a good note, it may come against you. It would certainly come back to help on you. If you are leaving an organization, always make sure that you resign appropriately. Don't be obsessive with your organization and then vacate your post. If reference checks are done, it may come against you. If you are leaving an organization, when you resign, make sure that you get acknowledgement of resignation. That will prove that indeed you resigned and were not admitted. We have we have had instances whereby people were hired, we got a job, but later on we had to even release them because either their company fired them or they did not live on a good note. And that tells us a lot. If you are going to a high risk area, if you're a finance officer or an HR person or a night manager, whatever role you are coming for, you have to make sure that your previous organization you have left there on a good note because of reference checks. Maybe let me leave them here. I don't want to speak much because for time, if you know to us. Okay, so I think Rafael, you've uh, nailed it. You've, you've you've said a lot. Said a lot. Um, you you have actually covered um, almost all the points. But one thing I also want to add is that you need to prepare for the interview. Preparation, preparation, preparation. You see, Rafa has said a lot about your, your appearance and uh, how you don't you don't bend the bridges and all that. Preparation. I will want to, yes, I mean, talk about preparation for the interview. Yes, the appearance aspect has been covered by Rafa. But when I say preparation in this case, I mean that you need to prepare for the actual interview, okay? There are there are common common interview questions, okay, that you you should I mean be prepared for. There are certain common interview questions you should be prepared for, okay. You shouldn't go into an interview and for example you are asked um, what is your salary expectation and you are now going to think about it. I mean, you should have a strategy going into that interview. You must go in with a strategy. You should know your value. You should know, you, you should research about the organization and know how much you are going to ask in the interview. Okay. Questions about, um, of course, notice period is, is, is not something that you can um, 
um, negotiate on. But your, you have to go by the terms of your contract professionally, like Rafael said. It's very, very important uh, because of future references and all that. So your, your myself, I also want to talk about your myself, okay? My, I call it myself. Describe yourself or tell us about yourself. This is a common question. And it is something that you need to prepare for. I, I would say that the whole interview process relies or depends on your myself. Tell me about yourself. Describe yourself. This is where you have the opportunity to ace the interview. Because by the time you open your mouth and you, you speak about yourself, you should be able to grab the attention of the recruiter. You, the panel should be out. You, your myself should be able, should be powerful enough to, to wow the panel. So you need to put in a lot of preparation in terms of your myself. I mean, the role determine what kind of preparation that you need to. And then also read about the company. Don't just walk into an interview room without researching about the organization. And then you are asked a question. Uh, me, for example, I like asking that question. I'll ask you, okay, so you want to work for ABC company. What do you know about us? Or what have you read about us? I mean, I can even ask you, what are our core values? I can ask you core values. I just want to find out if you are a serious person, if you have read before coming. So you need to prepare. Don't just walk into the interview room. Make sure you, you have prepared enough and certain common basic questions shouldn't give you a problem. Certain common basic questions should be easier for you. Fine, you can't predict the you can't predict the direction of the interview, but there are certain common basic questions that you can always prepare around it and then make you feel more comfortable during the interview. So preparation is important in addition to all that Rafa has said. If I, I would Thank you so much. All right. Okay, Emifa. Yes. Emifa, sorry, let me just add this point. It's very, very important. So as you know, was saying, if you have to introduce yourself, don't talk about things that are not relevant. Stick to your, introduce yourself, just in, highlight your working experiences, your skills, and your educational background. Recently, I, I did a recruitment, and then when the person was asked to introduce himself, it was like, I'm a boy of um, <laughs> I mean, we are not hiring kids here. You understand? So you need to be mindful of your language. Somebody too was telling us about the primary school he attended and all that. Those ones are not relevant. Your educational background, if you are university graduates, start from your university, the courses that you did, the number of the places you work and all that. Don't start by telling us the primary school you went to or the nursery school you went to and all that. Stick in or, your, or your hometown. <laughs> or your hometown, very good. Somebody said it. <laughs> We don't need your hometown. <laughs> we, don't need, we don't need your hometown. We don't need where you are staying, your residential location. Let the interviewer ask you that particular question. That question, when you are asked, is the best opportunity for you to tell yourself. If they ask you, they ask you to tell us about yourself. Stick to your working experiences, your skills, and your educational background briefly. That's all. Not my, my name is this. I come from La. Um, 18 years. I like Bangkok. No, 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 no. Those things are not important. Stick to your educational background, your skills, what you are bringing on board, and your working experiences. Thank you, Rafa, you know, because I was just about to ask, you know, when you ask this question, what are you supposed to say? It's so tricky. It's so tricky. And if you don't take care, you enter the temptation of writing about yourself, like when you're in primary school. And that's mm -hmm. what you just said, like, this is my name, this is my age, this is where I come from, this is what I like to do, and this is what I like to eat. So I think it's good. I, I wish this were not a, a, a writing session, like we're an interview session. I think it would be so good for, like, just to ask you how to answer certain questions. You know, tricky one, salary expectation. Another tricky one is your weaknesses, you know, People don't really know how to answer those questions. And I think it would be good to get responses to them. But we are not doing that today because of lack of time. I think people should be able to 
I don't know, contact you and ask you for, I don't know, some help if they, if they have any questions on that. But thank you. So grooming, um, bad mouthing your past employers, leaving on a good note and preparation are so, so, so key. I think I'm going to just hold off here. If you have any questions, it's the time to ask it and so that we can leave. It's getting late. It's a Friday night and we all deserve to relax. So I'm just going to leave like a minute. If you have a question, you can raise your hand. Otherwise, we'll be getting ready to round up. Okay, so I think Ray of Hope has a question. So just unmute yourself, Ray of Hope, and please go ahead. Uh, okay, so um, good evening, and uh, I'm glad uh, to be part of this uh, uh, evening session. I mean, uh, I've learned a lot, but uh, there's something that I wanted to find out quickly. Uh, uh, from my previous workplace, I used to, uh, and I, I undertook some short, short courses that uh, with that I was able to. I got certificates from that sessions, and I don't know, like, is it necessary to, or which aspect of the uh, CV do you bring those things? I mean, having your uh, those experiences I, I I got from the courses and the certificate I had, uh, where do I bring, where, which aspect? I mean, where do I bring them? Please, do you get the question, Enoch? Would you okay, like? Okay, so uh, uh, yes, I think that yes, certifications. Um, yes, at the column for or the, the portion for education, those um, certificates can be added. Yes, it's. I mean, it's okay to add those um, certificates there, especially if it is related to the role that you are applying for. If you have taken so many certifications or short, short certificate courses, but then it does not really relate to the role that you are applying for. You may want to um, take it out or not um, include it in that particular application you are putting in. But if it is related, if it will add up to your, your, your educational qualifications, your skills, I, I think it's okay. You can just bring it under the education um, aspects. That, that's fine. Ray of Hope, please, are you okay? Yes, I'm okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Emmanuel, please unmute and speak. Okay. I wanted to ask on the, the weaknesses part too, because I realized it's a question I, I find very difficult answering when you are asked what is, what is your greatest weakness? And I'm like, ah, but I, I always fumble with this. So I'll be glad if I'll be giving some few tricks and tips on answering such a question. Thank you. Okay. 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 Emmanuel, uh, yes, I think that um, it is a, a spot on question, especially if you are not prepared for it. So the way to go about it, like I said, I emphasize a lot on preparation, okay? And I, I mentioned that there are certain common basic interview questions that you need to, uh, I mean, prepare for, okay? Maybe I, I get to mention a few of them, okay? Um, a few of them. Okay, so something like um, your strengths and weaknesses, I will um, give you a clue, I will explain what do you bring to the table, how do you manage stress, difficult moments in your career, where do you see yourself in the next five years, what is your career path. I have even been asked my temperament type in an interview before. Yes, I have been asked, what is your temperament type? Uh, I mean, if you are not prepared, how do you go about such a question? So yes, so for the weakness, I would say that you, you, you need to be smart. And uh, the way to make it more easier for you is to prepare ahead, okay? So even before you go into the interview, you look at the role, okay? And you have, you have answers to some of these questions. So 
For, so for example, you can say something that sounds like a weakness, but also a strength. Something like, I, I can say something like, okay, so um, I, I think that when I'm working, I give it my all, I put in all my efforts, and I think it affects my work-life balance. Okay, this is, this, this, um, I'm presenting this as a weakness, but to the employer or the recruiter, in a way, it benefits the employer. Because if I say when I'm working, I put in my all, the employer see me to be somebody who is more in this, somebody who is serious with work and all that. But in another vein, that attitude of mine also affects my work-life balance. So it is, a, it is a weakness and a positive for the employer at the same time. So this is how you have to approach this kind of question, okay? You, you need to couch it smartly, okay? Couch it smartly so that, yes, it is a weakness, but it has a benefit aspect of it. So this is how you, you have to go about it. You, you need to be smart about it. And also, if you prepare ahead, it may be, I mean, a bit, a bit easier for you to answer such questions if you are prepared and open-minded. Yes. Ralph, I don't know if you, you want to add to it. I think either of you, you punch it right. You need to state your weakness and cast it in a way that your strength would rather come out. Yes, I don't want to go deeper because you already um, indicated it very well. Don't say state all your, your real weakness that for me, I like sleeping or no, no, no don't go to this, those even just couch it nicely. But let at the end of the day, let the employer rather see your weakness being your strength. All right. I would like to ask Emmanuel what he usually says as a response to this question. So that the HR guys will tell us whether it's a bad response. What do you usually say, Emmanuel? Sometimes I just try very hard to dodge the question <laughs> to be frank because I don't really know what the exact this is. Sometimes I just dodge it. <laughs> it's an interview, you can't dodge the question, you have to answer it. So, do you say I don't have any weakness? Not necessarily. I think the last one I did, it was with a school. So they asked my weakness in the subject. So I mentioned the um, creative arts when it comes to the drawing aspect. And the person was like, so how do you draw, draw the things on the board? And I was like, oh, I'll ask it, uh, a teacher who is strong in drawing to come and do the drawing for me. <laughs> Ralph, is that a good response? <laughs> that's, that's a very bad response. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me give you an example. So, for instance, um, Imano, if you, I'm sure, do you like working? Like, do you like working very hard? Let's just do it for one minute. Yeah. Imano, do you like, are you likely to stay at work longer? Yeah. Working? You are likely to stay at work, working longer, right? So you can yeah. use this rather as you um, overworking. Although it's a, it's a work-life balance, you are not able to have a work-life balance. So that's a weakness. But that's a positive thing for the organization to know that you are actually somebody determined to make sure that it's complete your task before going. Do you, do you get the, 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 the import? Yes, yes, please. Yes, so you don't leave duties undone. You make sure you complete all your tasks, which may go in a long way of affecting your work-life balance. So that's a weakness, but that's also a strength for you. So all, the, all that the organization will need to do is to just make sure that they put the processes in place to um, check your work-life balance. But it's not a bad um, weakness. I, interesting. That that can never be my weakness, anyway. <laughs> Thank you so much. I had an idea about that. Okay, I don't have any more hands, so I'll just read some of my questions. 
Someone is asking if there are vacancies in your organization. You know. <laughs> Uh, currently, okay, yes, I, I think currently I have I have one. I'm looking for an Italian speaker. If you are on call and you think that <laughs> you can speak Italy, you you can get in touch. Um, maybe yes, fine. Uh, if I you can share my contact, mm. and then if anybody uh, thinks they can speak Italy, um, uh, they can get in touch. Yes, I'm looking for an Italian speaker. All right. That is the that is the current opinion I have. Mm. All right, Rafael, you. Uh, we have a lot of roles we are recruiting for. We have about, about seven roles. Wow! But don't I call any we, of them so that we can talk after the call? <laughs> so as long as you are qualified for that role, you can apply. So we are looking for. I am in an hospitality background. We are looking for a bar manager. If you know you can manage a bar, you have the experience, you can apply. We are looking for a bar supervisor. We are looking for chefs. We are looking for um, reservations agents. No, that will we just build it. But you can go to the Marriott Careers. Once you go to log on to Marriott Careers, you click Ghana, you search for Ghana, all the rules that we have here. We have about seven rules that we are putting for. You can always give it a try, you may not know. You may learn that dream job. Wow, thank you. All right, somebody wants to know how to prepare HR documents, like employment letters, dismissal letters. I mean, do, do we need another session on it? <laughs> this cannot be handled in this session. <laughs> that, that is a whole session on it. <laughs> I can't even... I don't know why the person said it, but well, we can we can try looking at it another time. Yeah, okay. yeah. Everybody, just to add, so for those particular ones, they are they have more legal implications. So in terms of drafting employment letters or termination letters, if you don't draft those letters well, it can land you at the labor commission. So you need skill. That's more an HRO. You need a skill to be able to draft those letters. And if you are not sure. Anything we have various HR co communities that you can always fall on. We have various HR professional bodies, HR platforms. If you are not sure of anything, you can always contact some of these uh, networks. But you have to be sure it's a skill. It has legal implications. So for those letters, it better you have an understanding. You understand how the Labour Act works, what the Labour law says on everything. So if you are working on this, you can just issue termination letters to your employees, whether it, for whatever reason, without giving the reasons for which you are going to terminate the employee on, if it's only linked to your handbook. So it's a whole complex thing. I, I don't think we can treat it here holistically. All right, Enoch, if I don't qualify for a job, can I still apply? I would say yes and no. Yes and no because, okay, so yes, for example, let me give you an example. Okay, so the job advert says we are looking for an operations manager with 10 years of experience. Yes, you are an operations manager in the same industry, but then you have eight years of experience. The job is asking for 10 years of experience, you have eight years of experience. This example, you can apply, okay? Because uh, who knows, uh, you may be on the side of luck, Maybe the um, recruiter may end up getting, I mean, candidates who have less than 10 years, you understand. And in this case, you, you have a higher chance of, I mean, getting a note for the interview and, and all that, okay? So then you have eight, you can apply, it's close. The gap is not that much. But 10 years, you have two years of experience. Nope, I mean, that will be... That would be like uh, hoping for a, 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 maybe a miracle to happen or something. Uh, the, if the gap is too wide, they are looking for somebody with a degree, you have um, SHS uh, certification. The gap is too wide. You, uh, maybe if I hope you, you get a point I'm making. Uh -huh. Degree SHS, the gap is too wide. If it is degree HND, fine. Maybe they didn't get anybody with a degree. They may come down to look at the HND holders. Uh -huh. So it depends on the, the context. 
Uh -huh. It depends on the content. Some jobs you see them and you 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 can tell that no, this one is a no go area for me. Let me not go near it. Okay, but some you see it and you are like, oh, okay, maybe let me try. Me, I don't meet it fully. I don't meet the requirement fully, but I'm a bit closer. The gap is not too wide, so maybe let me try. Maybe let me try. Uh -huh. So yes, so it's a yes and a no. All right. Thank okay. You. Thank you. So I have another question. It's, it's asking about the difference between a resume and a CV. I think we've dealt with that. Someone is asking what he should expect in an interview. I think we also dealt with that. Um, should I use a colorful template for my CV? Mark was saying yes, but not too colorful. And then what are the don'ts in CV writing? I think we've dealt with that. How can I grab the attention of the HR at first glance of my CV? Ralph, how can we grab that? <laughs> okay, people are dropping off. We have to end soon. I think it, it's the outlook of your CV, which you've already dealt with. As of now, as of today, there is one candidate I'm still looking for because of how the CV looks like. But the unfortunate thing is that the number the person used is still not going through. We've not been able to reach out the number. The email to his bouncing back, but the CV was was just on point. Mm -hmm. So your CV can be so catchy that the interviewer will want to see the candidate, the face behind the CV. So just make sure that you, your CV is catchy based on all that we discussed. Okay, thank you. It should be neat. It should be catchy. Thank you. You guys have been fantastic, amazing. People are dropping off, and so I also have to drop off. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm going to take final words from my facilitators. I don't see any more questions, so I'm going to take final words, and then we are going to sign off, listen to some music and sign off. So, um, okay, Ralph, you go first. Okay, so I will say that um, Whatever be the case, always be sure you are you prepared enough for the role that you are applying for. Prepare well for every role. If you are applying for a particular role, prepare your CV for that particular role. Don't use the generalized CV for all roles that you are applying for. And make sure that you prepare yourself for an interview. Read about the company. Understand the job role you are applying for. And, and, and nowadays, most interviews are taking online sessions. So before, if your interview is going to take an online session, prepare well, make sure that's your. You just muted, Ralph. You have just muted yourself. Yeah, make sure that your dressing is on point. Even though it's an online session, dress well for your Zoom call. Don't have a Zoom call whereby you have a lot of noises at the back. It's, it's, it's a low low But whatever be the case, Prepare yourself for your CV and also yes. Thank you. You know, let's please show us your face for the last time. <laughs> yes, MFA. I think Ralph has said it all. Um, preparation is important. Okay, and um, preparation means that you need to put in the work. Like I said, job search is a full-time work. It is not easy. Um, the effort you put in determines the results that you get. If you are throwing generic CVs, cover letters around, it's, it's likely you may not get calls for interviews. Yes, it's, so you have to put in the work. You must work at it. You, if, if there is a role, there is a job advert, you need to study the job advert, go through the job descriptions, identify the skills that is required, and then use that to prepare your CV and then your cover letter. Your, your chances may, may be high than just throwing generic documents around. Okay, so I would say that yes, um, yeah, preparation. And also pray. Um, I, I believe in God. And I know Ralph also is a strong Christian. Uh, in all this uh, preparation we are talking about, I think that uh, favor is also important. And um, you, you have to also pray. You put in the work and you pray. And I believe that you will be successful.
Thank you. All right. Thank you. Everybody's talking about working hard, preparing, and God will help you. All right. Thank you. There are about 24 of us left. Thank you so much for waiting. Um, I think I'm going to, what am I going to do? I'm going to give like um, a giveaway. Like I, I'm going to give you an offer to send your CDs around for me to have a look at. I may share them with my facilitators if need be. And um, I will share the details of the offer in my thank you email. So you, you all get an email and then you can know what the offer entails and for how long you'll be able to do that. So if you really need somebody to look at the CV, someone has shared the link for Resume Now and Resume Genius. If you still need a human touch to it, I will share something with you that you can use to, um, so we can have a look at it for you. So that will be it for today. Thank you all so much for staying on till the end. I have, I have not just enjoyed myself, I've learned so much, really so, so, so much. I feel like applying for a job. I think I've, <laughs> I think I've changed my job. So I'm, I'm going to work on my, yeah, my and then uh, look around for some jobs and get some cover out there. You know, maybe hopefully I'll get a big job like Enoch or Raphael and be swinging in my swivel chair like a big man one of these days. <laughs> I really enjoy it. Thank you. God bless you. I, I don't know what else to say to you. And to everyone who is on the call, I just want to say thank you. A big, big, big thank you. And um, watch out for the next conversations on writing. Hope you can join by that time. I'm out. Good night. Bye. 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 Take care, everybody. All right.